Carter Emmert is the museum's director of astro visualization and has been involved in all five of the museum's space shows, four of which are now playing planetariums worldwide. Carter was on the NASA funded Digital Galaxy Project and directs the museum's space shows production. Carter has collaborated with visualiz visualization teams at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications and the San Diego Supercomputer Center. He has also previously worked at NASA Ames Research Center and the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Come on, guys, give me a warm welcome for Carter. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Mike up. Hey, tonight I'm not going to stand out here too long. I want to thank you all for coming and uh, hope to show you, give you a good show tonight of things that have never been seen in a dome before. And um, that story begins with uh, new software development, a NASA grant that we have. Our software that we're developing is open source, so it'll be free to the world, free for all of you to download. Uh, but also different ways to sort of uh, um, enjoy this experience tonight. We're going to be streamed live on YouTube. Um, and uh, if you're interested to look at that link afterwards as an archive um, and show your friends perhaps or send out it's a NASA grant uh, that we received to do this work over the, ne over the next five years or one year into that. But um, the uh, stream can be accessed if you go to the, that website. Also, we're on Facebook, so if you do open space on Facebook, you should be able to see the link there as well. And I want to give a shout out to our enabling code master, who is on top of this project, is extremely technical for all the different things that open space has to do. And that is the very capable Alex Bach. Alex, please put your hands up. Alex is uh, um, from Germany and is getting his PhD from Linköping University in Sweden. We began collaborating with Linköping University in 2002, developed the product called UniView, which is what we use to typically show in here. But this, we had sort of a debut with Open Space uh, on our Earth Day show. Um, but now with Mars, we've been carefully building the various pieces to put together into what you're going to see tonight. And um, the content of what you're going to see tonight uh, is taking a global map that goes down to six meter resolution, which I like to say is bigger than a car, but smaller than a house. Think about a two car garage resolution. So if there are any two car garages on Mars, we may have seen them. Um, but this data set is brought to us by your tax dollars at work, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter which has been up for, I believe, 11 years, just completed its 50,000th orbit. And the map that we have of the CTX context camera down to six meter resolution is about half of Mars. But we're looking at uh, working with Google to complete that picture because we have about 99% of Mars now down to six meter resolution. But the story gets better. And the reason the title of uh, tonight's presentation, the things we've not seen before, is because we're using the high-rise camera, which is 24 times that resolution. So if you do the math, that's 25 centimeters, which is smaller than a football. It's about this big per pixel. And why that size? It's to look at the landing sites, landing site candidates and determine what is a good safe landing site for our rovers. So Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, every two years there's a launch opportunity for Mars and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter got there two years uh, before Curiosity Rover uh, got to Mars and uh, they chose Gale Crater to land in. And that camera, once freed from the landing site priorities, is free to do science. And there are over 4,000 double coverage high-rise images, which means that there's stereo coverage left and right view. And from that, using photogrammetry, 
we can produce an accurate, accurately scaled. You're not going to see any vertical exaggeration tonight. You're going to see everything that we show you is going to be properly scaled in height. But from that, we can take this 25 centimeter resolution and extract basically a terrain map from that. So there are about 4,500 stereo pairs from high rise camera, of which in 11 years, the US Geological Survey has only been able to prepare 380 of them. I have four students with us tonight from the Bergen County Academy, so they're top placing high school in the New York Tri-State area, and their principal, Mr. Davis, is here. Mr. Davis, could you please stand up? Thank you. And I want to th and I want to thank you for your students. Um, and I have four Bergen County Academy students, and uh, first one I'm going to ask to stand up is Jenny Levin. Thank you. They're going to be presenting with me tonight. Next is, uh, remain standing, Janie. Next is Vince Malay. Or Vince Mallet. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I always want to say Mallet, like ballet. Uh, and, and next up is Brian De Palma. De Paolo, I'm sorry. These two guys are Eagle Scouts. I want to give them an extra uh, set of hands for that. And also... Last but not least, David Song. David, please stand up. What they did this year was to take 380 high-rise, high-resolution terrains and get them ready for open space, get them ready for tonight. Let's go. Okay, so I'm going to call on you guys to present uh, when you're ready. And, um, but right now, I'm going to go back and fly. So let's go. Okay, Let's sit down in the pilot's seat, and uh, I will be flying. So I hope, um, I also, I have to fly from here and try to respect all of you in the dome tonight. Uh, but some of you uh, will have a view where you might have to turn your head a little bit. Uh, we chose to do an omnidirectional dome, and tonight we're doing sort of flight simulator work. So I think we can start to bring the lights down and we'll see the red planet mars and i'm going to come in closer and closer and i also going to point out that i'm going to do my best but the flying tonight is a little bit might be a little stuttery and that stuttering comes in because our graphics cards that uh, are about five years old are being replaced um, starting tomorrow. <laughs> we, scheduled, we scheduled this presentation uh, not around the graphics cards. I'll leave it at that. I want to uh, point out Mars as we see it from the Earth. We could never see a very clear view. And where I have Mars right here is perhaps almost the best that we could get of imagery from Earth. Uh, but this is all satellite imagery you're going to see. But I'm stopping here with even our best photographic techniques and combining images these days. We can make out the Valles Marinera system. This is a crack in Mars as Mars uh, bulged out in what's called Tharsis up here. The stress relief was in the form of three volcanoes and a fourth one, this one, the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. And then these parallel fractures which form together the Valles Marinera system. And so we can see that here. We'd also see that Mars is this kind of ruddy sort of chocolate and orange color. Um, looking at Mars through one of the largest telescopes uh, built for the human eye, uh, 1993, uh, had the telescope for four nights with other artists, and uh, Mars is kind of a salmon color, but we can see darker areas and lighter areas. These are more high altitude, but the altitude has less to do with the coloration, more of the winds of Mars that circulate things around, and also more atmosphere that we kind of see in the low-lying canyon areas. This atmosphere did not appear on the dome until Saturday night, thanks to Jonathan Costa. He's from 
uh, NYU, and uh, Jonathan um, is uh, uh, one of our open space developers, and he's been working on this atmosphere for a long time, and uh, for just about a year. And so we're very happy to show that to you tonight. I'm going to come over first to a fissure area um, associated with the volcanics of Olympus Mons. So I'm going to just come around here like this. Also, this color map is some new work that's been done by John Parker. John's not with us tonight, but uh, John is our lead technical director for If You've Seen Dark Universe. And he also worked on Journey to the Stars. And uh, he's a very exacting digital artist, both uh, talented in painting as well as digital uh, and technical uh, capabilities. I'm going to come in now to Olympus Mons. It's about the size of New York State, three times famously, uh, three times the height of Mount Everest. It's Caldera. Um, far in excess of the, of the uh, uh, five boroughs of New York City. As we come in closer, we can see a scarp around the base of Olympus Mons. And I'm going to start to tip the planet over. Not wanting to go too fast. And just to bring it about like so. Well, we're going a little bit more so we can see the atmosphere. This mountain is so high that it sort of sticks out of the atmosphere just about. And we're going to come over to an area to the eastern flanks where these lava flows have come down and where we're going to look up close. That's one of these features here. So I'm going to turn it on. It's going to appear as this tiny little strip. And I'm going to also turn on a height map, which might make Mars bounce a little bit. OK, now we're going to come in closer and closer to this high rise strip. Now, the larger mosaic strips that you see making up this image are from that CTX, or six meter resolution. And as I get closer, we're also going to see the profile of Olympus Mons let me drop us down just a little more. I'm going to rotate around so Olympus Mons is more center stage for you all. And we're now going to come down into this, this fissure, this trough. And this area around the volcano um, from a distance far away, it looks kind of smooth, but then you come up closer and you're seeing the results of different types of features that we do have analogs for on Earth. These volcanoes are large shield volcanoes, basaltic in nature, similar to the volcanoes in Hawaii. And right up here, there's been a debate about what we're about to see. There, uh, there are the troughs that are etched in about 100 meters or so, or about the height of a 30-story building. But we also see more subtly now, as we get closer, these this sort of fluvial low-relief set of features, which was first thought to possibly be water um, being liberated by uh, the volcanics. And yeah, we're going to come in. Lower on this. So we see the low relief sort of flow, flow features. Let me push this out a little bit so that I can come around and steer into it. And you can also see a cross-cutting relationship right here in so far as the incising area of these troughs, probably being lava tubes collapsing and subsiding. And uh, let's just turn around a little bit like this. And Vince, I'm going to let you take it away here. Uh, just mention that the debate, about, I'll just mention one last thing, is that the debate about the fluvial nature of what carved the low relief 
um, has gone from being water to low viscosity lavas, which we believe the Earth stopped producing about a billion years ago, but seem to have persisted perhaps on Mars. So Vince, take it away. Thank you, Carter. So here, as Carter alluded to, we have this one large deep gash in the area near Olympus Mons. And the distinction between this large gash, as you can see with the pointer, and the more shallow relief area to the north is that one has traditionally been thought of as being due to the lava flows from Olympus Mons to the northwest, and the other has traditionally been thought of as being fluvia, uh, fluvial flows from either aqueous water-based sources or low viscosity uh, lava sources. And so we can tell here as we come in deeper into this fissure that this definitely was a high viscosity uh, lava flow because we can see here that the walls of the fissure are quite deep and the bottom is quite flat. And that's not the sort of shape that you see in a riverbed, which carves out and erodes the bottom of the bed in a much more uh, semicircular shape than this flat area we see here. We also see that along the edges of this fissure, it's a sharp, there's a sharp edge going in. And that when when the water, when a uh, waterway is flowing through uh, in ancient Mars, it would have eroded the bank in a different shape than we see here. There's also a noticeable lack of islands in this bed. And so what we see in ancient fluvial flows on Mars is that there's, you would see an island maybe here, maybe here, that's been worn away gradually by flows of water. And here we don't see that because here what has happened is that mag magma has risen up from beneath. There's been a crack in the plates at the top. Magma has risen up and is hardened from the shell that we see here. And so this contrasts with the relief that we saw before up north, which was shallow and worn away. As Carter mentioned, the sides of this fissure are about 100 meters or 30 stories up. And so we can see that on Earth, this would be quite magnificent because we don't see this kind of lava flow as we do see on the planet Mars. Now, Carter, if we could see the fluvial. The okay, north. I'll pull up. And so as I alluded to before, can see there are small islands in there that appear to have been worn away by water over time in ancient times on Mars millions of years ago. And that these beds here are much more shallow. You don't see the flat edge in the middle as we did before, and you don't see the sharp edge along the side either. And so this was either water, either aqueous, or it was low viscosity lava from Olympus Mons, as we spoke about before. Certain researchers do believe that um, the magma coming up as a result of, of Olympus Mons being so close could have also released groundwater from beneath the surface of Mars, which could have caused aqueous flows here. And that could have also resulted in the low viscosity of lava flows, which could have caused these more streamlined shallow flows. I want to point out one thing, Vince, is uh, we can see these craters, these are probably fairly young, but when you see a shape like this, I've asked I've se several times I've spoken about Mars and then afterwards people say, what were those holes we saw? These are impacts of meteors or, or asteroids that come in and Mars is a much thinner atmosphere so they could come in and do damage a lot easier than on Earth. So is that all, Vince? I believe it is. Great, thanks. Thank I you. think we're gonna move along to the next topic. That was awesome. And I'm just going to try to move up here 
and not make things too dizzy or too stuttery. But uh, to do that, I'm going to turn this off and off, bring it out of our field of view, and we'll rock it up. Next up, I wanted to um, point out some uh, features associated with the uh, Valves Marinara system. And so I want to uh, maneuver us over there. And I'll bring Mars a little higher. I know those sitting right across from me. Uh, I know it's upside down for you. I'm going to try to do my best. <laughs> I don't want to. It's, it's very easy to, to move a little too fast with a system like this uh, and make people dizzy. So that's another factor that we want to try to be a little conservative in our motion. And as we're passing over Ascreus Mons, one of the three Tharsis volcanoes, and we go a little farther south and we begin to see the Valles Marinara system come up. And this gives me a chance to um, give a shout out to uh, the BCA students last year and uh, that put in this terrain of Mars. And uh, if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is turn it off and turn it back on for a second. Um, and let me roll it a little more into view. In this case, um, the students last year had worked with Stereo CTX, and so let me let me make sure I turn this off and back on. Will that work, Alex? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so I just want to make sure first. Well, okay, uh, I have to have both its image. Okay. So this is, this is what the students worked on last year. Not the same students. Make sure, okay, so that, that seems to be registering. Okay, great. Jason Charbra, um, Ali, uh, uh, Ali uh, Ferrari Wong, her sister Kiara might be in the audience. I'm not sure if she came tonight and invited her, but she's a student at Columbia right now, majoring, uh, actually senior in astrophysics. She didn't know what she wanted to do and she did an internship here. She's now becoming an astrophysicist. So, uh, and um, also David Yang. So we're gonna come down. So this is uh, Western Kandor Chasma. In fact, what I'm going to do is make an adjustment so that we can see the surrounding CTX a little better. Just want to make sure I am touching the right thing here. Okay. And let me blend in the surrounds. There we go. So you might wonder why we've uh, made uh, a highlight in this section. And that is because there is a global height map. And the global height map, which is um, giving you the scenery that we're, or the height to the scenery we're seeing, is only about half a kilometer resolution. It's low resolution compared to the six meter resolution uh, that we're seeing now. Let me tip it over a little bit so we can see it a little better. Oh boy, I don't want to move too fast. And let me just, for audience sake, move it around like this a little bit. So that uh, maybe this time that part of the audience will see it a little better. I'm not going to come closer to, to the walls. Now, Mars uh, Canyon is famously quite deep. In this case, these walls are about the height of the Rocky Mountains, not as seen from Denver, which is the Mile High City, but would be seen from sea level, so about 15,000 feet up. Sea level, in this case, what we'd say is the bottom of the canyon. And we can see the, the bottom of the canyon is a little knobby. And then up here, we have the, the edges of the, this canyon. And so this is terrain from, from the CTX. Now, what I'm going to do is turn the terrain mapping off for a second. So let's come down here just to show you the before and after. So if I turn that off, this is the global map, which is kind of soft. 
and we add in what the high school students did using the NASA Ames Stereo Pipeline. Uh, and uh, Janie's going to talk a little bit more about that, so um, I'll let her talk about that. Um, but what's interesting is the features out here in what's called SETI Mensa, which is uh, the area here of layered deposits that if I come in and come out here about like so, where you see this, this strange um, set of layered deposits, and it almost looks like carved wood. And so here we have another high rise element that I'm gonna turn on. And I just need to <laughs> go to the menu system here, turn it on, there it is. And boom, it's coming into place. So this is high rise 24 times the resolution of the surrounding CTX. And to give it a justice, I have to come down here and make sure I'm also turning on the associated height map. And now to do that, what we're gonna do is move down into this terrain so we can see it. The reason that we do the, the CTX terrain modeling around it is that this would be sort of locally flat uh, from, from the low resolution of the global height map. That height map, the global map, is an amazing accomplishment from a, a laser altimeter. But then you have to interpolate between uh, these uh, ac uh, highly accurate uh, profiles, but they're only sort of a line on Mars. So you want to use photogrammetry once you have higher resolution images like this. So you might wonder, what's with this terrain? And this terrain is layered deposits later worked on by winds. And so we believe these layered deposit, deposits were probably laid down in the Hesperian time period uh, about uh, three billion years ago. So now coming in, you might wonder how tall these mountains are. They are also about 100 to 150 meters tall. So think, think of a tall building in Midtown, but that's about the height of, of these. And I'm going to tip it a little more. Hippity hop as we go over Mars. Better graphics cards tomorrow. Boy, it always happens that way. <laughs> but I'm assured, uh, Alex, what sort of frame rate what were we getting with the, uh, your 1080 cards? About 60 frames per second. Oh, boy, I wish I could show that to you. But you'll, you guys will just have to come back. What I'm doing is turning around so that we can see the far walls. And by modeling what's close to us, but also seeing what's on the horizon, and now we'll just let it fly a little bit. Let me start to move it a little closer to us. Fly like this. Um, I want to tip it a little bit more. And once again, these hoodoos or these little small hills are uh, 100 or so meters tall, is that we can really start to resolve how tall those canyon walls are. And also, I, what I like about this is this really harkens back to what a museum of natural history is. It's an experiential place in a way. You come and stand in front of these amazing dioramas and you're suddenly in Africa or, you know, you're in, uh, say, the Serengeti Plains in Africa, maybe a place you've never been before, but that you come to a museum like this and you're suddenly there at these places. And so putting together this and putting it into this facility uh, using data visualization and doing that live, we can really see what Mars looks like. So I'm going to move on from here and I want to go out to our next site, which is just over these hills. Uh, and uh, we're in Western Kandor Kasma right now, but um, going to climb up a little higher. Let me turn these guys off for a second. That and this one. Okay. That'll make it a little smoother. And I'm going to rise up and we're going to go across some of the higher planes. 
that were eaten away by this canyon. And so we're going from Candor Chasma, we're going southward into Mellis Chasma. And once again, I'm gonna try to just adjust uh, what I'm seeing here so that we see a greater view of the CTX. I'm gonna slow us down a little bit because we're going pretty fast. And there's some very interesting features over here that uh, are pretty much a slam dunk that uh, erosion was occurring on Mars by fluvial water erosion. And we'll see that just up over here. And Brian, yeah, Brian, I think we're ready to come in and have you, as you start to talk about this, I'm going to bring the high rise up for you. Okay, so uh, we are currently heading into Mellis Chasma, which is in some ways a very unique element of the Vallis Marinara system. This is because our old friend, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is responsible for all the images we're seeing today, has actually found evidence of sulfate deposits on the floor of the chasma. This means that there was water present at some point here. So it's very, very important to the field of astrobiology, the study of life out in space or the search for extraterrestrial life because the current method based on what we know of earth of looking for life in other places is to find water so melis has been a prime target for that it's also been a huge huge location that comes up all the time when talking about missions to mars in fact, the last three rover missions, the Spirit and Opportunity mission, the Curiosity mission, and the upcoming Mars 2020 rover, all considered locations in Mellis Chasma as their landing sites. Unfortunately, the terrain eventually proved to be too steep for the rovers to operate effectively, so they were scrapped, but it did make one of the eight finalist location sites for Mars 2020. In addition, you might have noticed that when we were further out flying over the entire planet, in the Vallis Marinara system, you could see the atmosphere appeared a little thicker. This is because the depth of all of these canyons is so great that the um, atmosphere is thicker. There's more space for atmosphere from the top of the atmosphere to the ground level. And this has the added effect of the air pressure being significantly higher at the bottom of one of these canyons compared to the, the surface and especially one of the mountains. Because of this and because of the mere fact that there was water here at some point and might even still be, it's a prime location for a potential human outpost to be put on Mars in the future. So it's very likely that as the exploration of Mars continues and we're likely to head into the age of considering sending people on interplanetary missions that Melis Chasma will continue to be a significant name that keeps popping up uh, about these missions. Right now we're looking at some sulfate deposits and a valley system around here. The Sulfate deposits, again, are indicative of water, which lends to one of the possible theories about Mellis Chasma. Um, there are a few different theories for what it is because of the fact that it is unique compared to the rest of the ballast system. So one of the other theories is that there was a lake occupying some of the chasma in the past and the sulfates, as well as the general appearance of the valleys and the channels down here on the bottom, lend some credence to that theory. So we're just flying over this very nice looking area with all the channels you can see. And you can see that it does have the appearance of dried up riverbeds, especially, not the right button, 
this area here gives a almost a Grand Canyon-esque vibe, even though we're actually on the bottom of an even grander canyon. But this is Mellis Chasma. This might be the first place that this might be for Mars what the Sea of Tranquility was for the moon in the coming years. Well, also, I, I think uh, our students tonight are probably the right age to uh, go to Mars. <laughs> I'm bummed. I'm too old. But anyway, um, we, we, we <laughs> but uh, tonight we all get to go to Mars. So you may you may see this bright spot in the sky. That's the sun. It's uh, well, it was probably about eight times bigger than it should be, but uh, that's okay. Uh, we were using that to definitely say that's the sun. Um, but uh, Brian, thank you. I'm I'm going to uh, move up and and go to the opposite side of the can of Mellis Chasma um, to look at uh, some of these uh, canyon walls themselves. And uh, yeah, let's move it around like so. And also to aid us, I'm going to turn off. Um, the Mellis Chasma height map, and see, I'm gonna turn off a couple other things too that I had neglected to turn off. You know, I knew tonight was gonna be tough to steer around and get everything done. So, okay, I think we're good almost. Let's see, close this up, close that up, Mellis off. Good. Okay. What I want to turn on is a feature which we'll look at when we get over there. So uh, to look north, due north is in the direction of these strips that we see uh, that make up the mosaic. And um, I'm just going to take liberty to climb even higher. And over that ridge is Candor Chasma. And oh boy, just let me rotate around a little bit like this. I know it's we're in close. No, oh, I'll go higher. Oh, bumpity bumpity bump. Okay. <laughs> and so over here is a nice high rise terrain of some of the wall rock and sand dunes at the base and uh, of the canyon system. Um, and this is still Mellis Chasma, but uh, extending off toward the east in this direction is the Coprates Canyon system. So what I'm going to do is tip this over so we can see it a little better and bring up our destination. You'll see it come on when I turn it on, as I'm doing right now. And I have to turn on, enable the height map for that. Great, and we're gonna come down now into this. This area around here are tremendous landslides. And so the canyon continues to widen. It's similar to the Rift Valley uh, in Africa, which is so large, we just call it a big Rift Valley, but it's, it's where the earth is actually spreading apart. And so we're going to come down, we get more atmosphere because we're going deeper and deeper and deeper into this canyon system. And now I want to bring you up close. Um, there are dunes upon dunes upon dunes, so different um, uh, size grains. And also, um, Alex is reminding me, thank you, Alex, uh, there's a question uh, from the YouTube channel. And is Mars older than Earth? Actually, the surface is a lot older. And that's because the erosion on Earth tends to cover up what was there, even though the planets are formed around the same time, that uh, a lot of Mars uh, that we see is um, basically preserving a surface that's uh, billions of years old. A lot of the fluvial um, of the uh, evidence we see for it. I'm going to move Mars around like this. So on the other side of the dome might be able to see a little better. So that uh, the period uh, where Mars seems to have had um, water, uh, perhaps 
carving on its surface, perhaps Standing Lakes, is about three, three and a half billion years ago. And what were we doing three and a half billion years ago? Well, your DNA was just getting started in the form of bacteria. Sorry to inform you, but uh, we were pond scum for about two billion years. Well, maybe we had to be pond scum to eventually grow brains and start mapping other planets and, and uh, thinking about the universe. So here we come up on some of these dunes. There are these tiny little dunes of finer, sort of more dusty material. And then we have dark sand dunes, which we attribute to olivine, uh, which is uh, ferrous and the manganese uh, uh, mineral that uh, is, is crystalline associated with uh, iron-rich basaltic lavas. And if we come up here, we can see this massive outcrop. I'm seeing color difference in the channels. I'm going to talk to our video engineer about that. I'm not sure what happened with that, but uh, um, I will just point out that we see lighter material here overlaying the darker material. And um, that is interpreted as the canyon ate into essentially uh, a uh, magma or, a, uh, or into essentially volcanic uh, deposits that were dark. And so we get the dark uh, sands, but then it's overlain by these landslides and uh, alluvium uh, coming down from a lighter material above. And that lighter material, most likely more clay deposits and uh, what they believe built up perhaps inside the canyons once they formed. And which actually uh, gives rise to um, some discussion about the next feature I want to show. So we're going to head north, and David, I think uh, we're going to take you to Juventi Casma. Uh oh, I'm not sure what happened there. Whoa, stop. Okay. It did that for me in practice. I wasn't sure why I was doing that. Okay. Oh boy, hippity hop. Here we go. I'm going to fly up, and we're going to fly over eastern Candor Casma, and I will. I will give a little shout out to my friend Keith Patchell, who's my other half in the Mars band, but we're going to, on August 1st, we're going to be flying over Mars with that. Um, but this is one of my favorite places to fly because there's so much to see in there, but we wanted to show you the high resolution stuff. So we're going to head off beyond it to the Northeast to Juventi or Juventi Chasma. So David, why don't you, I'll bring up what we got, but I'll let you, Tell our audience what we're about to see. All right, so Juventa Chasma was named actually after the Fountain of Youth by 19th century Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli. And a little bit of trivia here, um, Schiaparelli was actually probably one of the people responsible for why we we're so obsessed about life on Mars. Now he made plenty of uh, really important observations during the great opposition of 1877. Now that's when Mars was really, really close to the Earth. So even with our primitive technology from 1877, he could get a pretty good view of Mars. And he saw for pretty much the first time what he called canali. Now in Italian, that means channels. But um, American and English media translated that as canals. So suddenly there's a public frenzy about, is there life, is there intelligent life on Mars create these artificial canals? Now, of course, we know that um, these aren't man-made. They are, in fact, um, mostly carved by ancient rivers. But that's sort of why we are so much more fascinated with the prospect of Martian life as opposed to Moon men. Okay, so we're entering Juventi Chasma now. And some of the features you'll see here um, are light toned layering. Now, Mars is not like the moon or some planet like Mercury. It has a fairly active atmosphere. You, um, they're really large, um, long ranging dust storms, especially. So, the surface of Mars is, in fact, a little bit active because of all the wind erosion. 
And what you get as a result of that is um, lots of eroding of the rock surfaces, revealing sometimes multiple layers. Now, one scenario in which this happens is when there's volcanic activity, which produces more material, more new material, and raises that to the surface. Now, with the light layering in Juventa Chasma, we know that that is not the case. And one of the primary pieces of evidence for that was the presence of gypsum. There was um, the gypsum mineral at the bottom of the chasma. And what we do know is that gypsum does, is not produced or does not form at high temperatures. So that is how volcanic activity has been ruled out for this area. And instead, all we have is posited to be either um, you know, a result of fluvial activity with flowing water and some remains from perhaps an ancient Martian lake. So the sediments from the lake bed would settle and their various densities and time periods would cause so the stratification that you might see here. Uh, so I guess here we're seeing a better view of the actual layering. There we go. So here you can see what you might see um, on Earth in a dry riverbed or in a dry lake. You have lots of layers um, which form the same sort of contour. So that sort of shows that this is in fact the same system that may have dried out or have sedimented at various different points in time. And one more um, boon from the advanced in technology we get with the high-rise camera with a 25 centimeter resolution is that now we're able to see even the most minute differences in color. And some of these bands here you see right now, they weren't visible with the six meter resolution because they're so thin. Um, although some of the bigger ones, they are visible even from here. With the highest resolution, what you're able to see, what you're able to detect are when it's a very, if the slope is steep, then even a large amount of time might correspond to a small horizontal distance. So that was not originally detectable with the CTX or with any other low resolution camera. But with the high rise 25 centimeter resolution, we're now able to detect even those narrow bands that correspond to different periods of time. And again, these bands, these layering, uh, this layering feature should be somewhat familiar to you if you've ever seen pictures of canyons in the American Southwest, where we also have the same activity of rivers and lakes carving out these canyons. Now we're seeing about maximum resolution, I think, David. Wow. I, I'm seeing wow because I haven't seen this before. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're going to move on to the next one. Thank you, David. <laughs> As I climb up, we're going to head south to Eberswald Crater. Um, I'm just going to tell my uh, students that uh, because, of in, uh, because of time, we may not be able to make it through all of them, but uh, just because things are jittering so much. But uh, we're going to head south to Eberswald, and uh, so I just want to, um, okay, we're heading that direction now. Turn off Juventai, and off to Eberswald. Great. It's very nice to see the canyon with this haze in it uh, because it's lower lying and, and so thicker atmosphere. But don't be fooled, the atmosphere of Mars uh, at uh, the Viking landing sites in the 1970s uh, was seven millibars. That is equivalent to three times the height of Mount Everest. And as Sir Edmund Hillary said, 
uh, climbing Mount Everest was like trying to do a workout with a pillow strapped to your face. He would know. Climb Mount Everest first. Okay, let me pull up a little higher so we can find this darn crater. Okay. And let's see. If I may adjust uh, time for us so that we get a better illumination. If I can actually see from the haze, Holden Crater, and just to the north of it, oh, there's a big channel going into Holden. And oh boy, we're right up where it starts to get dark. No good. Okay. So let's just hold on to this for a second, folks. I'm going to bring this uh, higher up so that uh, our friends on uh, YouTube can see Holden Crater. Okay. Whoa. All right. And now I'm going to play with time. Hopefully this won't be too dizzying. Uh, okay, but let's see. Shift one. Oh, okay, thanks. Thanks, Alex. Okay, so we're going around. Notice how there's a blue rind. I actually get blue sunsets on Mars when sun rises, which is really bizarre, but that's the way the atmosphere works. And Jonathan Costa has done a nice job with that. Great, and I'll stop it right there. And now we can, there's Holden Crater. And right above it is Eberswalde. How do I say it, Alex? It's in German. It's Eberswalde. Eberswalde. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. If I spoke German, there are so many languages to learn. Okay. But in this little crater, it's almost uh, hardly a crater at all, but uh, uh, it's a very ancient crater. And so it's eroded. Uh, so this formed first and then later these 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 uh, valley systems water runoff had filled this um, crater most likely a lake as well as this crater down here um, there's a lot of stuff to talk about but I want to come down here and uh, we've got uh, Vince back up Vince Mallet will you 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 can start talking about this, and I think I'm just in range enough to start to see it. Great. So Everswald Crater is, was one of the four finalists for the Curiosity mission. Curiosity being the youngest rover that's currently on Mars, sent up there by NASA. And Everswald is so interesting to NASA researchers because of the significant uh, delta that can be seen in Everswald Crater, which we're going to be able to see very soon. We can start to see that now, yes. uh, but I'm going to bring this up. Uh, okay, hold on. And uh, episode, oh, that's the first one. Okay, I'm going to put on the height map, makes Mars bounce a little bit. But now yeah, let's bring up the image. Okay, hold on. There it is. Okay. Boom, now you're seeing it, great relief. I just want to also mention that uh, everything you're seeing here that's kind of like Google Earth on Mars, we call it this uh, globe browsing system. And uh, last year's students from Lynn Shipping, Eric and Kale, um, were here to do this. They did a Herculean job in just about six months. So, and Kale is uh, um, still sort of with us on the uh, developer team and uh, had made this possible because we had some errors and all this and he had to check this and do this remotely, uh, you know, from Sweden. So back, uh, back to you, Vince. So what we can see here is that this large structure generally resembles a river delta. And if you're not familiar with the general shape of a delta, it's like a large fan. And deltas generally form when a stream or a body of water such as a river flows into a larger body of water such as a lake. Early civilization on Earth formed along river deltas very commonly because they were good areas for agriculture, especially when it was difficult. The Egyptian civilization formed around the Nile River, Nile river Delta as it flowed into the Mediterranean Sea. And the delta in Eberswald crater is the best form delta that we see on the planet Mars. As Carter mentioned, the predominant theory is that 
in Eberswald Crater, there was once an ancient lake full of water and that this delta formed as rivers flowed into this large lake. We can see evidence here geologically of this long-term lake as we see here. We can see one flow coming into the high-rise image breaks into two flows, one going generally north and one going generally south. This is known to geologists as channel bifurcation, but to lay people it's just more generally known as splitting or a fork in the road. And this generally only happens when we have long-term flows and streams. This doesn't generally happen if we have flood events like other streams are formed. What we also have is a general, general sinuous motion or a wave motion that the stream forms. And this indicates a long-term pattern because as a river flows, it won't only flow forward, it'll generally erode at the banks around small turns, making them into bigger turns. And so what we can see is that this sinuous pattern is indicative of a longer term stream. What's interesting here is that the places where there once were water, as we see this stream here, is higher up in elevation than the surrounding area. This is called an inverted relief. This is because as the stream came through in ancient times, it deposited heavy gravel in the area, which as millennia went by, the light winds on Mars wore away the surrounding silt. The heavy gravel that was deposited there stayed. And so the areas that were once covered with water are now higher up than the areas which were once land. We can also see if we go up north a bit, what's known to geologists as, where is it? There. What's known to geologists as a meander and a meander cut off. What a meander really is, is a stream that goes one way and then turns back around in this wave pattern. Eventually, over a long period of time, if this lake was not formed by flood events, the stream would cut off the bank and cut off this wave in what's known as the meander cutoff. And this is known in Earth as an oxbow lake. This is actually seen many times that you get a body of water which just appears like this because it was once part of the surrounding stream. So what we see here is direct evidence that there was once a large lake in Eberswald Crater. And if we actually go farther north, we can see layers like we were seeing earlier in other areas. That area. We get good layer coverage because as this lake was emptying out and as the water was emptying into the lake, it eroded away these layers. And so we get, by studying these layers, we can see what the soil deposit was like through Martian generations, and we can study the geological time scale of the surface of Mars. And so this area is important and has been a candidate for study from NASA on Mars for many uh, reasons, but one of the most important is that it lends a lot of information about ancient flows on Mars and whether or not this theory that there was once standing lakes and large standing lakes, such as the possible one in Eberswald Crater, really could be valid. Thank you, Vince. That was awesome. Oh. Well, looking at the time, what uh, I'd like to do there were uh, several things to show, um, and uh, so I think we have to um, move on. But uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to first go just north of here to a place called Ganges, and then we're going to go to the Gale landing site for Curiosity. I know I'm just going to have to do this fast. Um, it's just difficult to uh, manage all this in the amount of time. But uh, what I'm going to do is come down into uh, a very exciting outcropping. Uh, these, it's called Ganges White Mounds. Um, and we're just going to look at this very quickly. Let me turn off Eberswald. And turn on 
the interesting item directly ahead. There goes the height. Scanji, uh, turn this on. Great. See that coming in. And Alex is reminding me that uh, those of you on YouTube, uh, I'm going to bring it into, into view better for you, uh, which means that I have to tip the Mars over a little bit, like so. Is that better, Alex? Okay, great. And I'm going to come in. I just have to show you this because um, just the way the lighting works on Mars, I have to kind of play with the lighting, but it made sense to sort of go in this direction from Olympus Mons, go eastward, and uh, so on. But um, this is a pretty exciting location here, I think, in my opinion. But uh, um, one thing that really stands out is that you can see the effect of the westerly winds uh, which create a wake around these structures. We can see the dunes. And if I come to the northernmost feature, you will see this dune wake around this mountain. And we're going to come in close, tip over like so. I'm trying to frame up so that everyone can see this, hopefully, and yeah, right at it now. Last night, my friend Blake was here. He took me up in a you know, tandem flight in uh, um, Salt Lake City. He has a paraglider, and uh, he says this is very much like paragliding. And he couldn't get over the fact he was sort of paragliding on Mars last night as we looked at this in trial run. <laughs> but uh, these light mounds, uh, we believe, are remnants of these typical structures that are found uh, in, uh, in, in these canyons. Uh, and they're built up, we believe, um, from uh, basically layered deposits of uh, silts and also uh, gypsum seems to be a, uh, an evaporate uh, form of, or an evaporate mineral that uh, indicates that uh, these canyons were at one point in the ancient past, perhaps three, three and a half billion years ago, filled with water. So I'll just come across the, the ridge of this. 25 centimeter resolution. The spiky things we see are actually uh, somewhat uh, some errors in the stereo photogrammet uh, photogrammetry process because of shadows. Uh, but there we see. Great. All right. Uh, Janie, last but not least, I, I want to get over to um, your site in Gale Crater. So uh, I'm going to pull up here fast and move over there. So, Janie, I, I think you, you've got a lot to talk about just even in the process of this. Oh, yes. So today you've seen Great. several candidates for landing sites of rovers, but now we're going to take you to see a winner. <laughs> so, Gale Crater. Gale Crater is kind of on a different side of Mars, so while Carter flies there, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. It's about 154 kilometers in diameter. At the center of it, there is a volcano known as Aeolus Mons, or Whoa. Mount Sharp in English. And the high-rise image that you will be seeing is located right off its crater rim as soon as we get there. So, yeah. <laughs> um, this particular location is pretty darn cool because it's actually the location of the rover Curiosity right now. But this image was taken six days after Curiosity landed. So Curiosity landed on August 6, 2012, and this image was taken on August 12th. I'm going to um, climb up even higher, Janie, because uh, I oh, really yeah. want to rock it over there. Sorry. Yeah, Gale Crater was kind of far <laughs> away. So we're entering night on Mars again. But I promise the rover's there. It's not hiding from you. Interesting features we're seeing here are I've been seeing for the first time. So strangeness going on. Let me, uh, sorry about this, Janie. Let me right. just, okay, turn Ganges off. Uh, and, uh, well, Carter's uh, looking for that crater. I'm just going to talk a little yeah. bit about how about this image in particular. So this is the only model so far that has been created at the museum. Most of these other uh, models came to us through 
the high-rise team in the University of Arizona. But this particular model was created here in the museum using the AIMS Stereo Pipeline, which is a software developed by NASA AIMS. It's open source, and which is pretty great because the high-rise team uses a program, co program called SocketSet, which costs $70,000. So we really kind of won. <laughs> Um, so, if I'm not mistaken, Gail is right about there. So, once we fly into it, yeah. I'll be able to show you some of the cool stuff that is actually on this model. But before we get there, again, uh, let's talk a little bit about Curiosity and its landing. So, Curiosity was the first rover to land with something called a soft landing. The previous two rovers landed by crashing into the planet with lots of airbags to cushion them. But Curiosity is, was kind of more massive and we were more advanced, so they so NASA created something called a soft landing. So first the capsule came down on a parachute to slow down, and, once the, and then the descent stage separated from the main capsule. Uh, the parachute and the uh, back shell flew away to crash into Mars. Carter, you're going to be right about here. OK. Um, Trying to and center everything so yeah. people on YouTube can see it mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> oh, this is directly above my head, so I'm craning my neck a little bit. But... Sorry. And the crater itself is about the size of Connecticut. So if anybody from Connecticut, uh, yeah, there's your crater. <laughs> yep. So the uh, image itself isn't directly in the crater. It's going to be a little bit off of its northern rim. But you can see some of the dunes that are right off the side of the crater once it turns on. But anyway, so the descent stage of Curiosity was something known as a sky crane. So it was a platform with four engines. And there it is. Look at it. We finally found it. Uh, so there were four steerable engines on the sky crane, which allowed NASA to slow down the whole descent stage to almost zero velocity, at which point the rover descended down from the sky crane on a tether, kind of like you would see on a normal crane, which is why it was called a sky crane. So once the rover was safely deposited onto the ground, uh, the sky crane disconnected from it using explosive bolts and flew away as fast as it could and as far as it could from the rover, at which point it kind of crashed into the ground. So if we could zoom in, Okay, I'm gonna we go. bring the CTX up a little better. Uh, now, I spent a lot of time staring at this particular location because this model was kind of my responsibility. Ooh, sorry, microphone th failure. This is a Herculean task that Janie did too, because it was uh, they NASA warned us not to do this. Yeah, the files are Don't very large. The computers weren't happy, and the pro the processing time for each of these models is about a week on one computer which is why there are so few created, but we do have a way to do it now, so yay. Um, <laughs> so coming down into the, into the location. Here's uh, the rabbit, Janie. There's it's the rabbit, kind of that's rabbit. our navigational so, rabbit. Yes, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so the rover, um, if you go down into this location right here, you actually can see some of the hardware from Curiosity's landing. So Oops. this dark splosh right here. Just a second, I'm gonna line it a little better here. Sorry, Janie. It's okay. Okay. So if, I, if you remember about a minute ago, I mentioned that the, the lander of Curiosity flew away really fast and really far. Uh, once its fuel ran out, it crashed full, full tilt into Mars and upended a whole top layer of soil. Uh, and this, un this unearthed this whole dark, dark soil layer. So if you actually go down right here, oh, sorry, this is a little bit difficult to look straight up and talk into a microphone. So you go right here. <laughs> this is the location that the lander crashed into. Um, if you zoom really far into it, which I don't think we really should do, it, um, the, I'm, I'm, I'm willing. We're going it. We're going there. The lander pieces are actually visible, but they're only about one or two pixels big, because if you remember, they're 25 centimeters per pixel. So the lander did kind of explode on upon impact. But right here, we see the parachute and the back shell of Curiosity. So there's the litter that we have left on Mars. And then, then there's, there's the crash jetpack. Yep, yeah, there okay. it is. So all like, of this stuff is like kind of human impact on this planet. So we're starting to we're make our impact on up this. Mars. In this yeah. Okay. Sorry, Mars. There we Make go. Mars better again. But yeah, aw. Oh, sorry, <laughs> couldn't help it. And, and over actually, here is Curiosity. Curiosity itself is right there. It's that dark speck. So and since this was six days after it landed, the lander had not, um, the rover itself hadn't really moved anywhere yet. It was still running all of its checks just to make sure that it was okay, that it had survived traveling through space. And since it's moving around as we speak, it really was okay. So that is a pretty cool thing that we have. 
we have this image of it six days after it got there, looking all nice and photogenic and a couple of just a couple of pixels big because Curiosity really isn't that large. It's about the size of a Mini Cooper, I think. It's like yeah. 10 feet long. Yeah, so to get there. there it is. Oh, okay. Say hello to Curiosity. It actually everyone. bumps up on the height map a little bit. Yeah, it does. It's really pretty cool, actually. And it does shadow. give us the opportunity to look at all of this stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. So the way so. that this image was created was that HiRISE provides us with a uh, list of these image strips. Um, all, they take a right observation and a left observation, just like kind of like your eyes see. And using the stereo pipeline, the AIM stereo pipeline, we're able to mosaic these strips together and then overlay them one over the other to get the 3D product. So, and that is how we get all of these models that you are seeing today, but specifically this one that was produced here at the museum. Whoa, sorry about that. I Moving fast when you see the parachute and Mount Sharp, and that's Mount Sharp in the background. Mount Sharp is somewhere, I can't actually yeah. see it, but okay. I and I'm not sure if there was another, well, okay. I think we are going to be going to Q&A and we're a little bit late at this point, but uh, um, I want to I wanna thank the students.